and welcome to our latest roundup of science news from New Scientist. I'm Caroline Williams and I'm a feature editor at New Scientist. This time we've got dancing robots, a picture that can turn from Einstein to Marilyn Monroe and the latest on depression research. But first, can you tell me what these rats are doing? Find out what's really happening at the end of the show. And now for a robot that really knows how to move. Keep On was built by a team of Japanese and American researchers. Here's new scientist technology reporter Celeste Beaver to tell us more. Keep On is a robot that has been programmed to find the beat in a piece of music and then dance in time to it. The robot can also track movements of someone or an object that's moving and dance in time to that as well. Keepon has a soft, rubbery body made of silicone and filled with wires. The wires are attached to a motor below that tugs on them, a bit like an inside-out marionette. Keepon's creators hope he will have applications off the dance floor as well. Psychologists have shown that people who synchronize their movements to match the person they're talking to are more engaging. The hope is that robots that could do that would also be more engaging and might also be more natural and more acceptable to humans. So it sounds like future robots will not only be able to dance, they'll be able to chat you up as well. And now for some static images that are just as exciting as any video. Hybrid images look completely different depending on whether you're close to them or further away. New Scientist online technology reporter Tom Simonite met technology feature editor Greg Huang to find out how they work. Hi there Greg, can you explain to us just how they created these brilliant optical illusions? Sure, so what you do is you take two original images and out of one you filter out what are called the low frequencies which are the features that change slowly over the, the course of the picture, the, the coarse and fuzzy part. And then the other one you filter out the high frequencies which are the, the sharp edges and things like that. And th then what you do is you add the two pictures together and you get what's called a hybrid image. And this is a very startling feature that up close it looks like one of the images and you step back a few meters it looks like the other one. And I understand these images are also being used to investigate the way we perceive what's around us. So when you look out the window or you're driving down the street your brain has to make sense of all these different images and information that are coming to you through your eyes at different scales, different resolutions. So the question is, how does the brain make sense of these different lines, these different features that might be coarse or fuzzy? And so researchers have devised all these interesting experiments where they will flash you a picture of, say, a city street in 50 milliseconds and see what you see uh, compared to showing it to you for longer. And, and by showing a hybrid image, what, it turns out that the brain takes different amounts of times to see the, the coarse features compared to the uh, high frequency ones, which also corresponds to being close to something or being far away. Okay, but will these images ever make it beyond the research lab or the pages of New Scientist? Mostly it is, it is pretty much for fun, but it's, uh, so it's, important, it's an important way for researchers to be able to probe how your brain is making sense of these information at different scales in, in the visual world. You might also see it uh, on, on, in advertising and in other industries, because some companies are interested in using this technology to either display ads that change as you get closer to them, mm -hmm. or uh, companies might be interested in the security aspect. So if, you know, if you're at a cash machine, uh, you don't want people to see your password or what you're doing, or the cell phone display, or, or on your laptop, you don't want somebody looking over your shoulder. So this, is, this kind of technology could be used so that only the user in front of, very close to the screen, could see what's on the screen. Hybrid images coming to a billboard near you. Now to bring you the latest stories from Science Every Week, new scientist staff have to meet in with the researchers at conferences and meetings. We met up with Liz Ells, New Scientist Associate Editor, to find out about her latest conference trip. 
Hi Liz, I understand you went along to a conference called Depression earlier this week. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Well, you'd think it'd be something you would want to get out of bed for, isn't it? But it actually, it turned out to be very exciting because there are a lot of young researchers who are trying to take their field forward and so they marshaled this big conference with a lot of players, you know, important people and a lot of quite new research and, and papers in, you know, papers were about to be published. So it was quite cutting edge, really. Okay. And uh, what are this younger generation doing differently from the people that came before? OK, well, I talked to the um, main organiser and what he said was that really they want to break down the barriers between sort of mind and body because it doesn't work like that. You know, depression's as much in the body caused by the body or in the body as it is in the mind in a way. So it, the symptoms and the whole way it works just doesn't work like that. So you need, to, you need to bring a whole raft of new techniques to bear and that's what they were hoping to do. Neuroanatomy, genomics, proteomics, all the new cutting edge stuff that's out there. Okay, and uh, is the idea to understand the problem of depression more, or can, is this the kind of thing that could be helped to design treatments? I think probably both. I think it's going to be, it'll give us much more precise answers about, you know, how drugs work and why they don't work and how they might cause unexpected side effects, which is a major problem right now, and how they might even cause odd escalations of the, of the problem we have already. So they're going to make them more precise, but they're also going to have, a, I think, an effect on the broader intellectual world. So we'll learn things about how, you know, corticosteroids work, how the whole stress system works, and also perhaps a lot more about the conscious brain and its different states, which would be very good to know. And I understand there was some discussion about possible links between the health of your heart and depression. It's quite controversial actually, it turns out. I wasn't expecting this, but it turned out that um, some people believe that, the, that stress um, has a direct effect um, on the cardiovascular system. Other people believe it's the other way around. So it's a lot that people are fighting a bit about this one. And some people are thinking that this isn't actually a very good way to look at it. But other people believe that there is a direct link between the heart and, and heart disease and the stress, and the cortical, cortical, corticosteroids mm. and the whole stress axis. So that's a lot, there's a lot to be unpicked there and quite a bit of controversy going on. Look out for more on those issues in future editions of the magazine. Now it's the end of the show and it's time to go back to that mystery clip. We asked you what those rats are doing. According to neuroscientists at Washington State University, they're laughing. When rats are tickled by humans or when they play with other rats, they emit ultrasonic whistles outside the range of human hearing. The researchers say this is laughter, used to distinguish play from threatening physical behaviour. And that's all for now. Thanks very much for watching. And don't forget to check out the stories we featured on newscientist.com.